Hi, uh, thank you so much for coming. Oh, oh my God. Hello? Wait, let me check it. Okay, wait one second. Okay, let me just do this. I'll be right back. Okay, cool. Uh, translation works? Okay, cool. Yeah. Uh, uh, thanks so much to Aud, and thanks so much for coming, and thanks so much for having me and inviting me and everything. Everybody's uh, very thank thanked. Uh, I'm very tired today because I had a very early flight, so I will m maybe, uh, slightly, maybe slightly more difficult to understand me. So if something is unclear, you can raise a hand, and you can just be like, and because I'm going to give Muriel, the translator, a really hard time. Uh, so it's anyways. OK, so I'm just going to show a little bit about how I make my work and somehow the main themes about it, and then s talk specifically about the Jonas Lund token a bit. Um, I usually use this slide to, dis to say that I make works that exist within networks and operate with different types of rules. It's a sort of central theme in most of my work to redefine or restructure rules and regulations and make contracts to s try and subvert some type of power structure. And that's why I include this slide because it's a triangle, which is the greatest representation of a hierarchical power structure where someone sits on the very top and decides for everybody beneath them. It's like the, the king, right? So, and I've looked into this particular power structure for quite a long time, the art world, whatever makes the art world spin around. I hope I have the right presentation, by the way. I think so. Uh, so, basically, I looked specifically at the art world because it's extremely hierarchical, you know, like the top 100 people decide the fate for most people, most artists, and then the lower you get, the the lower you get in the triangle, the less agency you have within this network, and you're just like uh, the laborer, basically. So it spins, yeah. And also, it's like I make work, the work about that, not only because I'm an artist, but also because it has this magical thing, which is that art is whatever the art world is, is art. So it's like, uh, maybe there's a feedback way. So basically, it's uh, like in uh, not entirely, but largely subjective. So if you come from a background in programming, as I do, you look at that network and you think like, oh my god, that's like uh, very open for subversions and exploitations. Because if you find a way to influence these top 100 people, your career is basically made. Right? So it's a great example to you know, uh, operate within this. Uh, like This is another great slide. It's like the guy at the top, he's the boss, right? So how do we get to the boss? And probably I'm like there, the very bottom, or maybe mid, mid tier manager, I don't know. I don't know. So one of, th I've made like very quickly, I made like my first step was to make l sort of a database of the whole art world to be able to a uh, analyze it and write algorithms about it. This is a res work from 2013 called the top 100 highest ranked curators in the world. So this is a curatorial ranking algorithm that just looked at my data sets and then decided, okay, these 100 people are the 100 people on the top that I need to influence for me to have a good career, right? So number four is, I think, so because this is from 2013, it's uh, not totally up to date. I think number four now will be number one, which is Hans Ulrich Obrist, which is like, you know, the classic, classic uh, world famous curator. And Klaus Biesenbach is number 11. And most of these people have curated uh, Venice Biennials. Maybe I tried this microphone. Hello? Okay. Okay. I <laughs> used to. I don't know, it cuts out. Anyways, okay, uh, continuing. Uh, this is a result of an other using the same data set. I created an algorithm for producing instructions for how to make works that w were going to be successful or somehow or like more strategically placed. 
and it gave me the title material, dimensions, color spectrum, and location in the exhibition space. It's also from 2013. The exhibition was called The Fear of Missing Out. It became somehow a very important work in my practice, I think, because it uh, included a lot of these different type of strategies for working with the data, trying to figure out the subversion or try and find a formula for what constitutes success and how to produce these values that exist. Right? So this one is called, this is a crashed motorcycle. It's quite self-explanatory. The title is Trust Trust Veered Luck 221. This is a black Sunday satire ping pong table behind non-reflective glass. Steve Ballmer, a fridge and six crates of beer, which the title and material and the instructions is the same. And, now, and then this is shield, white chapel, is in scoop, acrylic and silk screen, ink on custom rope. I like this one because it's like you're climbing the rope and you try and get higher and higher and higher, but then you just hit the ceiling. And then uh, this one is called Cheerfully Hat Sander Selfish. It's a coconut soap, seven minute, 50 second video loop, which the algorithm then decides that you have to put the video inside coconut soap. And how do you do this? Would you just use some epoxy resin, pour it on a monitor, and then dissolve a body shop coconut soap? And then you solved the problem of abstraction. So, and then continuing, it's, I'm gonna go through these works very quickly because I've only spent four minutes and 40 seconds and I think I have 30, so it's okay. Um, this is from 2014, again, just example of trying to subvert a system, which is a series called Flip City, 40 paintings uh, installed, just shown like this as a sort of storage rack, uh, looking into different types of predatory behavior in the art market. It's not so important to know uh, like all the details, and you can find more. All what we need to know somehow is that the paintings are collages or remashes of very successful works that were performing for a very short amount of time, performing very well at the art market. That didn't necessarily benefit the artists, rather they benefited kind of predatory collectors. So in my way of being invited to do a show at a gallery in LA that played not a large part, but a sort of part in this, because two of the artists he was working with had works sold and resold and increased in value like thousands of percent in a couple of years. So I made 40 paintings with GPS trackers stretched uh, attached to the stretcher bar. So basically with the GPS, I could track them, how they moved around within the art market. And then as a sort of Trojan horse, right? The Trojan horse becomes like a little token that I can put inside the collector's house and I know where he lives and then the more I know the better and then it's like voila. And it has terms of ownership stamped on the back which determines the rules and regulations of what the collector may or may not do. So he may not tamper with the GPS tracking device, he may not like, and should he offer the painting at auction he needs to include a certain paragraph uh, for the auction catalog. And then later they went on to auction because we sold the paintings to some of the most notorious flip collectors. So then they try and sell it at auction, but it never really took off in the speculative market. Um, following year, I had in my uh, sort of naivety of working with a gallery, you know, the power balance of the collector gallery artist. I had somehow uh, thought it was a good idea to make 40 paintings and then sell it to the worst collectors so they can flip it on the art market. It's not a good idea, you should not do it. So then I learned, and so then I had to correct it or reclaim agency within the system. So then here, this exhibition was 24 paintings with rules written on top of them by a sign painter. Uh, what the collector or the gallerist may or may not do, or who may buy them or not. So one of them is this one. So. This painting may only be purchased by a collector who agrees to purchase two more works by the artist before March 21, 2017. And then, and then this, is, this painting may only be sold to one of the following collectors, Anita Sabludovic, Simon Dupuis, Beth Rudy de Woody, and Alain Cervais. And so, and then we have, this is a classic one. So this is, exists in a pair. So this painting may only be purchased by a collector who also agrees to purchase donation. And then donation is this one. So then this painting may only be purchased by a collector who will donate it to one of the following museums by March 21st, 2020. And it's the Moderna Museum in Stockholm, MoMA, Tate, Hamburger Bahnhof, Lackmann, Stedelijk Museum. 
So then you wonder, yeah, but what does it mean if you put the rules on top of the painting, you can just break the rules, right? Wrong, because the artist has the ultimate power over this, because the artist has the authenticity weapon, tool, necessity. So at any point, if any rule is broken, I can just void the certificate of authenticity, and then it's no longer a valid Jonas Lund artwork. It's a lot of power, which is really, it's useful. So, and there's a website for this one. The previous one also has a website where you can see the locations of all the paintings, like flip-city.net. Flip this is like stringsattached.info where you can check if all the paintings have been, uh, if they're still valid or not. Uh, there was one, ah, anyways. Okay, so that was a short introduction about some of the, some of the few works um, from a couple of years. I before this talk started, I looked at Aude's presentation, and because she included critical mass, I took it away. So I'm not gonna be talking about it. But except for one sentence to just say it was an exhibition where basically all the viewers have the agency to influence and control what happens in the gallery space, pretty much. Uh, following this narrative of platforms giving you what you want when you want it. And responding to your si signals, etc. So I think that's it. So, and then I think, yeah, Jonas Lund Token started last year and I was doing an exhibition in New York and I've been thinking about this idea for a while of uh, distributing agency or influence. Like really the question is how do you reach like a strategic decision? How do you come to this like the best, should I do this or this? Or like, should I come to Paris for this talk or not? Should I do an exhibition there or not? What's the most strategic way of making a decision? So this is the kind of a, um, work that explores this through like financial incentives for strategic decision making. I'm giving uh, Muriel a hard time, I think, with the translation, but I'm not sure. I don't think, yeah, everybody understands English okay? But also listen to the translation because it's hard work. Sorry. Uh, so the the tagline has it: "Become a shareholder with agency over future decisions concerning Jonas Lund's artistic practice." So that means, and we can read more in the terms of ownership. So everything comes with rules. Yeah, so many rules. But it's really nice with rules, you know, because unlike abstract paintings, it's extremely specific, and you can just decide how it's going to be, and that's it. And that's the rule. So basically it says that the Jonas Lund token is an artwork by me. Jonas Lund token is a cryptocurrency based on Ethereum ERC20 token standard, which is this kind of like copy paste, make your own cryptocurrency kind of thing with a fixed amount of 100,000 tokens. The smart contract address is zero uh, X six, um, yeah. And um, then 10,000 of the tokens are distributed by me to form the initial board of trustees. So like I give out 10,000 to people whose advice I value or people I like or people I think are good for like increasing the uh, like contextual position of this artwork. 80,000 are distributed in three separate phases, which gets into like detail of these different types of phases. It's basically like how do you get access to the token because you can't just buy it right now. And then it just says, uh, I think, Paragraph 13 is important for me. We will look into it later, which is that 5,000 tokens are reserved for the Jonas Lund token bounty program. The bounty program is where you can do favors for me and in return you get tokens. So it's a kind of you scratch my back, I scratch your back kind of uh, thing. I lived in Brazil for two years. So I think that's where I picked up this strategy a lot, where you do favors for favors, kind of under the table. No, like, you know, I guess it happens everywhere. It's just different types of layers of, like, social institutions that accept bribes or not. Um, and then it goes on. So in the beginning, on the exhibition in New York, you could only get the Jonas Lund tokens by acquiring one of these Jonas Lund token artworks. And every artwork that hangs on the wall comes with X amount of tokens. And then the price of the work is decided by the price of 
the Jonas Lund token, and then it's a sort of circular thing. The shapes were somehow inspired by different financial institutions. And then here's the, I mean, yeah, that was very quickly. Yeah, you can go back. I'm just making a picture. Yeah. Uh, anyways, and then here's the sort of a top secret screenshot from the interface of where you uh, can see different ongoing proposals or proposals that have closed. So uh, there's a vote there, number 10, is like make closed proposals public, which needed a super majority, which it didn't get, so that's why it was shut down. And I will show you some examples of different type of votes and the consequences of this and how it kind of functions. This is a very easy one. I got invited to, to give a talk at Resonate, which is in Serbia, I think, in Belgrade. No, Belgrade is in Romania. Uh, Serbia, yeah. Oh, yes, Bucharest, yeah. Anywho, I got invited to give a talk there, and then the board, this was the first proposal, I think, one of the first ones, and then the board voted that I should do it, which I, I really didn't want to go. So it was, uh, so in the end I didn't go, but then I broke the protocol, but I had the greatest excuse because the board did not know that Resonate didn't pay their speakers from last year. So when I told this, it's like, no way I'm gonna go there to give a talk if they haven't even paid the speakers from last year. And then after the fact, I heard it was terrible. Like all the venues got canceled and nothing happened. So it, I think it, the board understood my decision. Then it also can look like this. This is from a show going on right now at Kindle Contemporary, Kindle, which is a institution in Berlin and a former brewery. It's in a group show called Behind the Screen. And then you wonder, how did we get to this look of the banners? So here's the Kindle show banner design. Uh, this is a follow-up proposal to proposal number 12. Proposal number 12, it was decided that we should do banners for this freestanding wall. I might have m mixed up the order, yeah. Okay, it's this one, sorry, this is the first one. So basically, the vote is what should we do for this uh, freestanding wall? We don't have to spend too much time reading the details. So there's four different options. Either we do didactic JLT banners, something like this installation there. Each of you JLT board members get to add whatever you like to the wall. One JLT banner on the front and the back wall, some JLT board, board members source content or none of the above. And then the banners win quite a lot. You can see the final result is like uh, a lot more tokens for the banners. Banners it is. So this is the banner follow-up proposal to that previous decision. So basically in this case, I know I have to make banners, two banners that are six by three meters big. So then I'm gonna, and because it's specifically about the Jonas Lund token artwork, I will then submit four different designs for these banners, four different looks, four different solutions for these banners to the board, and then the board decides what should go in the show. So it's really like this, uh, I mean, we're here to talk about the blockchain, but now we're talking about voting, but I mean, you know, in a way, it's the, the voting process of the sort of reaching consensus of saying, okay, the majority rules in this case. So the option one is a kind of very didactic, very didactic looking banner that explains everything. Option number two is similar to these wallpapers with some patterns. Option three is like some huge Jonas Lund token uh, binary kind of thing. And then option four looks familiar, yeah. Oh, option four is like these ones where we can s go up and see, yeah, option four won by quite a large margin. And I think um, knowing this, like, you know, I would never have done this as a sort of default, but then after after having submitted it to the board, I think like this was the best solution ever because it's so ridiculous to have this 3D, 3D metal token shape with the most, I think Gail, one of the board members said, it's like the most solid hole to invest your money in, you know, because the hole is the token, you know, the rest is just the blank. And then uh, in the same exhibition, we also have, this is like the 2019 look of the Jonas Lund token artworks, which is also a result from a vote, like how they are designed. Basically, again, similar process where for, because it's a modular system, token pieces go on a whiteboard. So then there's four different options for what type of uh, 
what type of design it should have. Should it be like figurative animal shapes? This is like the elephant. You know? Or should it be more like uh, clean shapes, representative token abstractions it's called. It's like, you know, would be more old fashioned possibly. My least favorite, but it's an option. It's like ornamental patterns. And because we're making three, so the option four is like one of each of them. And then it's really obvious which one won, I think. Because the figurative animal shapes is just like hands down the most exciting. Obviously it's like, you know, it's like an elephant. I tried hard to think of what meaning the elephant brings to the, the cryptocurrency <laughs> discussion about blockchain. And I think the elephant represents like, you know, strength, but then uh, humility and like the softness. I think that's nice. And then here it's either a bird or a cat or a fox. I like to think of it as a fox because it's, you know, the famous Linus Torvalds quote, which he's the creator of the Linux kernel. It's like you gotta be lazy as a fox. So meaning lazy uh, in a clever way, right? It's to like subvert, to like go around, find a shortcut. Yeah. yeah, and then this I think, I think I thought of it as an ant farm, you know? like How do you say ants in French? For me. For me. That's it. And then uh, last year in Art Düsseldorf, which is an art fair where galleries bring art to sell to collectors in a pretty obscene way, I did a, a Jonas Lund token booth with a Vienna-based gallery called Untitled Contemporary, which is a very creative, <laughs> very creative gallery name, I gotta say. Uh, and then instead of showing any artworks, it was just an announcement that Jonas Lund tokens are available for sale. And it's a funny anecdote about this because the jury, every art fair awards like the best booth to one of the young galleries and then you get some discount or special prize. And the jury spent like two hours in this booth having a big argument because they wanted to award this booth, the best booth at the art fair. But then the conclusion was that, yeah, but there's no artworks in it, so we can't do it. Which is, you know, it's super funny because it's totally missing the point because it's artworks in the show, but you know, anyways. Here's the Jonas Lund token bounties, which I briefly discussed before, of which Odd has received quite a lot of them uh, from doing different type of things. So you can uh, get different amounts of tokens. This is very typical for like newly formed cryptocurrencies. How do you incentivize uh, advertisement. It's basically an easy and very cheap way of getting lots of people to tweet about a certain upcoming cryptocurrency or something like this. So this is my sort of tongue-in-cheek version of this, except it only applies to me. So you can include a work by Jonas Lund in a group show. In a gallery, you can get up to 200 tokens. Invite Jonas Lund to give a talk, you can get up to 200 tokens too. Someone needs to, you know, submit uh, a claim. And there's a range of different, I mean, I, number 19, give Jonas Lund good advice. You can get up to a thousand tokens, you know. It's pretty good. Write a letter of recommendation, invite Jonas to teach, invite Jonas to give a workshop. Then you submit a claim here. And then here's a um, future in order to, again, you know, participation is difficult. And I know Nick will talk a bit about participation in sort of, consensus building systems, but how do you incentivize anyone to participate in anything, you know? Or it's uh, super difficult. So in one of the pivots, pivots, you know, it's like startup lingo for doing a new thing uh, for the Jonas Lund token was to create a private Jonas Lund token Instagram account that only token holders get access to. And there it's like quick, quick, yes, no answers basically. So this is from Tuesday this week of installing a show in Ljubljana. So the question is then, okay, should the artworks be leaning or hanging on the wall? So like say like vote lean or vote hang. Shit, I lost two downs. Uh, and then in the end, the board votes for like, okay, so it's gotta be hanging. Because I was convinced the leaning was the better choice because it like looks, looked really nice. But then in the end, I thought, huh. And then I followed the board's advice, and then in the end, I liked it better, so. 
I think uh, it's good. You always need a reason for your decisions. And now I have a whole like high powered, you know, Slum Token board that makes this the motivation for the decisions crystal clear. So, but then if someone would ask me, why did you hang them? And then I would just say, because the Jonas Lund Token Board voted for it. Right? Um, yeah. I've been speaking for 23 minutes and 30 seconds. And I think, I think that gives you a pretty good idea of it. There's obviously a lot of different consequences and problematics that come from it. But I kind of did the Jonas Lund sales pitch of myself now, where I mostly talk about uh, how it's beneficial for me. I think there's a lot of different things. We can discuss it more in detail later, I think, and also if there's questions and stuff. All of these different things, like the bounties and things, you can find it on the Jonas Lund token website, which is like jlt.ltd. And then there's also the terms of ownership and all the different things. So I think on that I'm gonna end with this, my latest favorite video, which is this one. <laughs> Which is, uh, I mean, I wish I made this as a sculpture, but in red or gold. Because it's a uh, automatic, you know, like how your phone counts steps? You count steps, so this one count makes it seem like you walked a really long way. Like you walked all around Paris for like days and days and days and days. And this is to get discount on health insurance in China. So because you can get bonuses or incentives for it. Like you get lower monthly costs for your health insurance if you walk a lot. So then obviously these devices sell you know, quite a lot. It's so dark and so genius. It's like a problem and a solution in one. And it makes so much sense. And at the same time, it's so depressing and I think that's like fantastic to end on this it's like how do you subvert the system right like this is the it's the greatest system subversion like hijack little simple gesture to just like capitalize uh, or just as a necessity to survive 